So we begin today on the other side of the sea in the country of the Gerasenes, entering into the longest, most detailed miracle story in the Gospel of Mark. And it's important to note that the landscape is acting in this story from the very outset. The other side of the lake is indicative of those, uh, to those having familiarity with the region uh, that Jesus and his disciples have now entered as Gentile territory. And when they get there, as soon as they had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met them. He lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke into pieces and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. This was a man who was triply unclean. He was possessed by an unclean spirit. He was living in the unclean tombs. And he was living in a land that, as we'll see shortly, was populated by hordes of pigs and demons. Halvor Moxney explains, a person who is perceived as deviant must be removed from the ordinary to the out of the ordinary. This man was banished from the community of the living to dwell among the dead. Afflicted, unclean, unruly, out of control. Then Jesus engages with the man and his demons about their name. What is your name? And the man replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, we tend to read stories of demon possession in the Bible as antiquated renderings of personal afflictions, uh, seeing stories like this through a medical lens of healing, compartmentalizing the world into the individual private spheres and the corporate public spheres, reading exorcisms as speaking to the private life of the person. But we miss something important about this and other exorcism stories if we're too quick to dismiss the story as a primitive story of uh, misunderstanding, as a met of a medicalized situation. The demons reply through this man's voice to Jesus. My name is Legion, for we are many. And everyone hearing that statement in the first century region of Palestine would hear those words with clear overtones of Roman occupation. In fact, this story is full of military terminology that we miss in the English translation, but that would have been clear to the original hearers. The legion was the largest unit of the Roman military. And the 10th Legion stationed in Palestine had the insignia of a wild boar on its banners, which makes what's, what happens next in the story an even more powerful image. Now there, on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding. And the unclean spirits begged Jesus, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned in the lake. Uh, you see, when I said that the landscape of Mark is never neutral, is always communicating. There are many layers to that truth. Yes, there is the meaning and experience of sea and land, wilderness and inhabited places, mountains and deserts. But there's also 
a socio-political question ever present as well for Mark and for us. Moxney says it this way, at the center of the relations between colonizers and colonized is the occupation of space by the colonizer. But this occupation of land is not clear cut or un an unambiguous situation. Uh, and demons and demon possession stories have a way of conveying something about this socio-political layer of meaning, especially this story questions of occupation and the power to expel. We can hear the story as saying something about this man and his relationship to the human community from which he was expelled and is now reunited through an act of exorcism. And we can hear the story saying something about relations and boundaries in society. For Jesus, Moxney says, Exorcisms appeared to be a way of speaking of control and domination of space. Jesus's exorcisms represented a form of protest against this oppression, the empowering of persons who were possessed. Hear that on the individual and the political levels. He continues, exorcisms as expressions of God's power thus signal that God establishes God's kingdom over the land. In this way, the kingdom is not just an imagined place, but an experienced place. The reigning presence of God coming near is not only a personal reality for those being healed, those being restored to community, those being called on a journey with Jesus. It is also a socio-political reality that challenges the occupying forces. And it is a topographical reality rooted in land and places that communicate the presence of God come near. The swine herds ran off uh, and told it in the city and in the country. Uh, then people came to see what it, what, what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demo demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy God has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. The man volunteers to go on the journey with Jesus. To come on the way, the path, the road, the journey. But Jesus refuses him and tells him to stay. And contrary uh, to the message that Jesus delivers to nearly everyone else in Mark's gospel who experiences the healing presence of God through his activity in their life, Jesus doesn't tell the man to keep silent and to tell no one what has happened. He tells him, go and tell your friends what has happened. He is the only person in Mark's gospel given that command. A Gentile, once triply unclean and banished from society, now sent on one of the very first evangelistic missions to tell the good news of the kingdom reign of God come near. 
Then they cross back over to the other side of the sea and a great crowd gathers around Jesus. And one of the leaders of the synagogue, synagogue named Jairus, a powerful man, a wealthy man, a religious leader, someone of genuine social significance, falls at Jesus's feet. He's the first Jewish leader in Mark's narrative to show genuine interest in Jesus and to respond to him in faith. My little daughter is at the point of death, he says to Jesus. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And then Mark engages in a storytelling practice that he didn't invent, but of which he makes frequent use. Starting one story, then interrupting that story with another story before finishing the initial story. So pay attention to what ties these two sandwiched stories together, because Mark doesn't do this by accident. And a large crowd followed him to Jairus' house and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhaging for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was not better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Jairus is wealthy, male, a religious leader, a parent. The woman in the crowd is a poor, unclean, childless woman both seeking healing from Jesus. Jairus wants his daughter to be touched by Jesus. The woman takes the initiative all on her own to reach out and touch Jesus herself. She is concerned that touching him with her unclean body will render him unclean as well, but she reaches out her hand anyway, immediately. Her hemorrhaging stops, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? And he looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And this scene challenges much of our popular wisdom about faith. It puts to shame every cheap message about how much faith one needs in order to experience the grace of God. Every shame blaming the victim for their own misfortunes. Eugene Boring says the woman does not say to herself, if I believe strongly enough, but she believes in Jesus's power to heal. Yet Jesus does not say, my power has healed you, but Your faith has saved you. Neither Jesus' power nor saving faith exist in isolation from each other, Boring says. Jesus himself awakens faith. It is not an independent religious attitude or conviction that can be brought to him. And the word for healed at the end of this passage is also a word that could be translated saved. In fact, Boring translates the last line in this way. Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and remain healed from your affliction. It's a type of healing, a type of salvation that carries both physical and eschatological dimensions. Uh, Boring says it connotes deliverance from the enemies of life that threaten authentic existence. And it is a word that communicates 
a continuous state of healing, not a simple one-time act, a lasting, continuous, long-term, always in process deliverance. So in addition to putting a challenge to our popular notions of faith, the story of this woman is also an invitation to consider our understanding of healing. After 12 years of living in an unclean state at the margins of society, a poor, unclean, childless woman, the healing of her physical ailment began to save her in so many ways from the multitude of enemies of life that threatened her authentic existence. And then we're back to the story that Mark started to tell and interrupted. While he was still speaking, some people came from Jairus' house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Uh, and when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Understand here that the funerary rituals had already begun for this little girl. When he had entered, he said to them, well, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And perhaps needing a little levity at that moment, they all laughed at him. Uh, then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told her, them to give her something to eat. The woman with 12 years of uncontrollable hemorrhaging and Jairus' daughter, 12 years old. Jarius asks for Jesus' healing touch in an audacious and public way and receives that healing touch for his daughter in the privacy of her bedroom with the instructions to tell no one. The woman touches Jesus in the most private, secretive way that she can, a quick brush with the hem of his garment in a bustling crowd. And she is compelled by Jesus to make the healing act public for all to witness. The reigning presence of God coming near is awakening faith for everyone. Gentile demoniacs sent on a mission in Gentile territory. Synagogue leaders with money and power and social standing and poor, unclean, childless women, too afraid to make a public scene from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other, from the unclean tombs to the synagogue. Jesus is provoking awe and amazement in everyone. Then Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us too? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them all, you know, the prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed, and he was amazed 
at their unbelief. So Jesus goes back out among the villages teaching, and he sends the 12 out two by two, and they uh, go out preaching repentance and casting out demons and anointing the sick with oil and healing them. Then Mark interrupts the story of the disciples' mission to tell the longest story in his gospel that isn't directly concerned with the activity of Jesus, rendering the story of King Herod beheading John the Baptist. Then we're back at the culmination of the disciples' mission endeavors. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. What they talked about together as they rested and recuperated and were restored by the wilderness place, we do not know. Perhaps after such a sequence of events, they talked about the same things we might talk about after witnessing such a sequence. Like, what kind of a way are we following that brings about a personal and a political deliverance from the enemies of life that threaten authentic existence? And what does genuinely practicing that kind of faith demand of us? And if faith is not a religious attitude or conviction, but something that is awakened in us by a divine encounter, how will we position ourselves to receive such a faith awakening experience? Either prostrated publicly like Jarius, or in a brave but hesitant reaching out of our hand like the woman in the crowd. And if we get the chance to go back home again, to visit those who think they know all about us and where we come from, would we have any words from our experience to share that would evoke in those who know us so well that nothing could ever surprise them? Uh, such words that could evoke an incredulous response like, where did they get all this? And what is this wisdom that has been given to them? And what is this faith that has been awakened in them? <laughs>